Okay, so hello everyone. I will be chairing today's webinar and uh, I'm just gonna briefly introduce James. So James Richard Otieno is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Fogarty International Center Department for International Epidemiology and Population Studies. This is with the NIH in uh, Maryland, the USA. And um, James's research interests lie in the genomic epidemiology of pathogens, basically experiences, particularly with viruses and bacteria, with the aim that results from such studies will inform public health intervention in public policy. So his current research aims to understand how the virus, the virus host jumps, the routes of spread, and the factors that determine the dynamics of spread at different social scales. So for example, health demographic surveillance systems at a countrywide scale, at a continent scale, and basically also globally. So answering these questions involves bringing together pathogen surveillance, evolutionary processes, geography, and host ecological dynamics and then employing phylogenetic and phylogeographic approaches and tools. So he has a capacity for, uh, a passion for capacity building and he's currently a trainer in implementation for genomic epidemiology in low and middle income countries, keen on building local capacity that is critical for both routine and pandemic surveillance uh, of pathogens, e.g. the current COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And he's also part of the training workforce uh, development technical working group, which is uh, with Phage. So, brief, just his, uh, yeah, I've mentioned he's a postdoc. He also completed his PhD in uh, with the Open University in 2019, and this was uh, based at the Camry Wellcome Trust. So, today, James is going to be talking to us about seasonal coronaviruses, and the title of his uh, presentation, as you can all see, is What About Seasonal? coronaviruses. So I'm going to hand over to James and uh, we'll be taking questions at the end. I think that's okay. Or uh, if he's okay with uh, being interrupted midway, he'll let us know. So over to you, James. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Martha, for the wonderful introduction. Yeah, feel free to interrupt me at any point in the presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions or clarify something. So obviously we in this um, you know, the season of coronaviruses. And um, the next thing that came to us was like, what about the seasonal coronaviruses that we've had for quite a long time? And we've had this for, um, if you look at the history of when the different coronaviruses were isolated, you can see that we start with uh, some two of the earliest seasonal coronaviruses to be isolated. So that is in 1966 and 67. So these two, 229E and OC43. And I think until 2003, when SARS, the initial SARS was discovered and caused some uh, pandemic across the globe, though definitely not on the similar scale as the SARS-CoV-2, um, there was very little interest in these coronaviruses in humans. And then after that, um, two new seasonal coronaviruses were isolated, namely NL63 and HKE1 in 204 and 205. Um, I'm pretty sure you remember the 2012 mass coronaviruses in camels and humans, and definitely the uh, current times of SARS-CoV-2. So as we think obviously about SARS-CoV-2, the question is how much do we know really about the seasonal coronaviruses that have been with us for at least um, over uh, 50 years uh, since the initial one, so I, I first isolated. So there are four seasonal coronaviruses, namely 229 ENL63, OC43, and HKU1. They mostly cause um, mild symptoms and, um, but occasionally you do have for infants, young children, elderly and immunocompromised, you do have uh, life-threatening bronchiolitis and pneumonia. There are no vaccines or antivirals, so the treatment is slightly supportive and they account for up to a third of the human respiratory tract infections in different locations. The detection does vary by location and time. 
And what has also been shown is some sort of a synchrony in the detection of the differences in the coronaviruses. So you do find, for example, in epidemics where two to nine is higher, you find NL63 potentially low, and the same has been shown for OC43 and HK1. And the distinctive difference here being that, um, so these two are part of the same genera. I don't know if you're able to, can you see my mouse pointer? Yes, we can. Good. So 2 to 9E and NL63 are from the same genera. So these are alpha coronaviruses, while OC43 and HKU are beta coronaviruses. So there seems to be some asynchrony in the different epidemics in some places that has been shown. Uh, obviously, due to the mild uh, you know, disease presentation in largely most of the population, there have been limited uh, long-term epidemiological studies, and that also has to do with evolutionary studies as well. And <clears throat> uh, the studies that have been there have shown, obviously, that these are zoonotic pathogens. So 229E is thought to have emerged from bats, but using camels as an intermediate host. Um, NL63 is thought to have emerged directly from a bat coronavirus. HKU1 is thought to have emerged directly from a murine coronavirus. And OC43 is thought to have emerged from a bovine coronavirus. So a murine to a bovine and then a bovine to a uh, uh, human uh, virus. So these are the presumptive ancestors. So the genomes are uh, ranging from, so these are an RNA genome, so from 27 to 30 KB. And this uh, pictorial presentation of the genomes, you can see how varied the genomes are, not just between the different genera. So for example, uh, alpha and beta coronaviruses, you can see uh, some of the open reading frames that are in the beta coronaviruses are not present in the alpha. But then even within the beta coronaviruses themselves, there, there is some substantial variation. So for example, you see the HKU1 and OC43 having this hemagglutinin esterase uh, uh, protein that is actually thought to have come from um, birds, and it's not present in these other beta coronaviruses. Uh, so there's lots of variation, um, both between genera as well as even within uh, viruses, uh, from viruses from the same genera. Um, so, what are questions of interest? So you might be asking, I mean, if this is already known, then why should we bother? The thing is, if you've been following um, what's been going on with SARS-CoV-2, you might have realized that, you know, the origins of a virus keeps sometimes seems to be a moving goalpost. So one time you're pretty sure that this emerged from, for example, initially a pangolin, and then at some point, like, oh, it might seem to have emerged from a bat uh, coronavirus or a G13. Or like, oh, it could also be that, you know, uh, different proteins might also um, have different origins. So we are interested in um, evaluating if this is still the case or with additional information, because some of these studies were done uh, several uh, decades ago, is uh, with additional data set, does this still hold? And just relating to my second point there is whether the different proteins actually do have similar evolutionary dynamics, so those are different. And uh, here we picked four structural proteins and with uh, significant uh, roles uh, for the virus. So you have the nuclear capsid that protects the RNA genome, you have the spike that is critical for the attachment, and then the envelope and the membrane that are important for the packaging and uh, um, you know the viral uh, 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 the viral assembly process. So just trying to understand if there's some coherence or congruence or there's, uh, that they have different evolutionary dynamics. The third thing that we're interested in was looking at the diversity, and this is in terms of pairwise nucleotide diversity, and also just trying to understand the recombination patterns. You do know how um, coronaviruses frequently combine, but uh, the, recombination, the, the, the recombination patterns and even the recombination rates similar based on the fact that they're all seasonal coronaviruses or they're quite different uh, in, in indicating the diverse uh, origins. The last thing we're interested in is looking at the adaptive process from um, 
an amino acid angle. And so if you can imagine um, right here, we are looking at what sort of um, amino acid changes are associated, for example, in the adaptive or the host transmission process. And also like uh, once this virus has um, uh, established itself in a given host, so what sort of changes do we see within uh, that particular host? So those are our questions of interest. So which methods to use? I'll try to move fast because uh, quite a lot. So this is work that uh, it's almost done. So hopefully it should be published soon. I was able to download all the coronaviruses in GenBank. Uh, we had about 60,000 then. So obviously this did not include SARS-CoV-2 because I mean, that would have been 2 million. So. Uh, probably right now, I don't even know how many SARS-CoV-2 sequences we have. And then um, obviously removed anything that, so there are four genera of coronaviruses, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So uh, we eliminated gamma and delta because the seasonal coronaviruses belong to neither of those, those two. And just did some filtering, you know, looking at uh, sequences that either had no collection date, there were lab strains, there were primer sequences and all those kinds of things. And then once we had the sequence alignments, we manually edited those, generated some uh, ML trees, and these are important to be used for calculating the combination rate. So we used a software called Clonal Frame ML. So it takes in the tree that we've generated at this point and the sequence alignment, and it's able to give you some estimates of the recombination rate relative to point mutation rate, and as I'll show um, in the results. Then with this sequence alignment, we're able to calculate pairwise diversity. And as you know, for phylogenetics, obviously, usually when you have a combination in the data set, it will always mess up your inference. So the next thing we're able to do is to detect uh, signals of recombination in the data set. And what uh, I did was to uh, remove the recombinant regions from sequences that were flagged as recombinant. Uh, but if a substantial chunk of that sequence was uh, chopped off because of recombination, and it ended up that the length of the remaining sequence was less than 50% of that particular protein or the whole uh, length of the genome, then that sequence was eliminated. So we ended up with a new um, alignment data sets at that point. So it's this recombination free data set that we are able to use to perform this analysis to generate these phylogenetic trees uh, at this point. But we also wanted to look for signatures of selection in this data set. So uh, what we used as input at this point was the recombination free phylogeny here, but using the sequence alignment that had everything because obviously uh, the selection pressure that you want to see is not just acting on, on, on a sequence data set without you know, the, the recombinant regions. At the same time, we are also interested in making inferences of um, uh, amino acid changes along the uh, evolutionary pathway of these viruses. So we did ancestral reconstruction again using the beast trees as a guide but then using uh, these sequence uh, alignments that are, have, uh, you know, it's the full data set, not just the recombination free data set to do that ancestral construction. So um, uh, uh, having done that, so describe the data set, I'll quickly move to the results unless somebody has a question. So obviously the first thing we're interested in is looking at uh, the zoonotic uh, events. So if you look at the whole uh, set of the four seasonal coronaviruses, what you immediately see are these um, lines that are associated with HKU1. So you'll see that I have HKU1 all and HKU11 and HKU12. So there, there are actually three known HKU1 genotypes called A, B, and C. We have just named them one and two. Um, when you look at the estimated most recent common ancestor for both, actually it predates all the initially isolated in 1966 and 67. Remember HKU1 was initially isolated in 2005. I don't know if this is the right time to ask. Um, 
probably you could just ask. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cool. So my question was that. So you you were able to work with sixty thousand coronaviruses from GenBank. So my actual question was, what was your filtering mechanism? Because you probably had much more than 60,000 sequences in GenBank that were, depending on whatever filtering terms you use in pulling the data, that were um, for SARS, right? So did you have to filter down to 60,000 or that was just the precise number of sequences? That you that so that's, your uh, search. Yeah, so you're right. So the uh, I mean, I'm usually for these things, I'm usually as general as they come. So I just typed coronavirus. So I didn't want to limit by taxonomic ID or anything. So as you can imagine, you get things, you know, you get primers in there, you get. So the first thing that I did, so the 60,000 actually, I should have mentioned that this is at that stage, I eliminated anything that was SARS. Because at that point, so this was uh, sometime in uh, 2020. Yes. This has taken a long time. Already there were like hundreds of thousands of SARS-CoV-2 sequences. So this does not include any SARS. And uh, I think I might have eliminated, um, at that point, I think we still had mass. So ideally I downloaded everything. So you're right. So the, the initial data set was much larger than the 60,000. Okay. Um, yeah. And you are also aware that NTBI now has a virus specific database. So that you don't have to, yes. you don't have to go to GenBank, you could just go to that particular one to pull SARS-CoV-2 data. Well, that is true. And sometimes it's easier. <laughs> I mean, I always say if I have time in my hands, I would rather just delve deep into everything. Okay. and do the filtering myself you know i mean obviously if if this is you know you need something quickly then obviously you just want to go to the virus database and you be very specific because it helps you even filter by genera filter by you know even species if you wanted and and, and it's much more much 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 easier i see peter has a question yes um when you said download from genbank did you download from the genbank website or did you use like a uh, one of the tools like NCBI, um, what's that thing? There's the NCBI genomes, uh, fetch uh, uh, um, Python scripts and things like that. Or did you just go from the website? So in my case, I, I, I prefer to use Genius, which I like because, you know, it, you can just set up, uh, what do they usually call it? Uh, I forget. But, you know, you can just set up the term and it could just um, keep updating without, you know, having to get blocked or a Python script that has to wait in between downloads or things like that. So in this case, I just use Genius. It was simple and straightforward. Yeah. All right, so um, if there are no more questions, I'll just proceed. So obviously we see very early origins for HKU1, but then if you decompose this into the individual genotypes, we'll see why this is important to decompose the HK1 into individual genotypes shortly. You can see that the estimated origins or most recent common ancestor are actually much later and probably just a couple of years ahead of the initial isolation. So it seems that they have much younger dates, but combined they have a much earlier date. And Obviously, the next question you're thinking is like, why is their combined origin this much earlier? Are they two separate introductions? Are they two separate viruses? You know, uh, and things like that. And we'll have a look at that shortly. So the other thing that I would probably want to mention is that we don't see any consistent pattern. So uh, in as much as if you were to go by isolation date, you'd have expected something like this, like an initial isolation for 229E and then OC43 and then NL63 and then HK1. So which, I mean, if, if you're going by the median dates, <clears throat> the, the, the timing in, in spike seems to, to show. But then if you look at these other proteins, then you can see that these things are all over the place. So whether this reflects the diverse origins, uh, why some are younger. So it could be that, you know, uh, some have origins in, in have much younger uh, origins in, in a different zoonotic host, or could it just be an issue of sampling? 
because there's a bit of heterogeneity, if you can imagine, uh, you're, 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 you're looking at a recombination free data set and there's some stochasticity in there that some of these sequences you have to eliminate depending on you know, how much chunk of, of, of their sequence was uh, flagged as recombinant and you have to remove the whole sequence, right? So uh, with that in mind, so we'll just go specifically to, so what do we see? So first I'll start with NL63, which is this one in blue right here. And what you immediately see is that they share most recent common ancestor with bats. And you can see that this backbone is black, which represents the bats. But so obviously showing uh, uh, an as, you know, ancestry in, uh, from a bat coronavirus. And this is consistent looking at the whole genome as well as the spike mucocapsid membrane and the envelope. So this would be the blue here and the blue here and the blue here. The other one would be two to nine here, which is in red. So I'll start with this letter three proteins here. And what you immediately see, or first you remember that the hypothesis is that there was a jump from bats into camels and then into humans. And if you look at the green here, you can see that this camel coronaviruses actually are sister clades to uh, bat coronaviruses. So in the nucleocapsid, in the membrane, and also in the envelope which indicates that you know, they have ancestry in bat coronaviruses. So, and if you conversely, if you look at the human clade itself, you can see that they share most recent common ancestor with uh, bat viruses going by uh, discrete trait analysis from this. So it seems at least for these three proteins that there was, uh, they have origins in bats directly and not uh, camels, all right? But then if you look at the spike and averagely across the genome, these two coronaviruses actually do share most recent common ancestors. And, and that's where the question is like, did you have uh, a bat uh, a coronavirus at this point? And then what is the host of this particular node? Was it a human virus? So you had bat to human that persisted into human, the red, or then, you know, jumped into camels, or was this a camel virus that persisted in camels, but, you know, jumped into, into um, the, the human population. So the thing is, while you could look at things like um, posterior probability for these particular trees, if you looked at the host probability at this point, they seem to vary and you don't, you, we couldn't get you know, that certainty that it's, it's originated from this specific host. So one of the things that we tried looking at so fast is just look at what is the most recent common ancestor for these two different coronaviruses and does, it, does one seem younger to give you an implication of, uh, of what might have come first? So if you look at that, so we've also just added the parent to the most recent common ancestors to give you an estimate of, you know, the, the bat, uh, the estimated date of the, you know, the bat virus at that point. So if you just look at the median values and forget about the 95% uh, posterior density around that estimate, you do see that across, you know, uh, all the structural protein as well as the whole genome. So the median dating of the human coronavirus is actually predated us of camels. So it seems like, you know, the, the, the human ones might have emerged earlier. But then for, for the most part, like whether it's across the genome, for nucleocapsid and for the membrane, you can see that there's some overlap. So you can't really say that, you know, this really came earlier than, uh, than the other, but you do see lack of overlap in the spike and as well as in the envelope. So clearly this might a bit earlier. But then still that does not, tell you really like, okay, um, did you have a case of, you know, bat to independent jumps or do you even have a case of reverse zoonosis? So um, we looked at, so one thing uh, that you can also get from BEAST is that it estimates the host transition. So uh, in, the, in terms of Markov jumps, and if you average that over the tree and specifically for the whole genome, what you, do get is that 66% of the, those host transitions into humans uh, are estimated to have come from bats and 34% uh, from camels. 
And at this, if you look at, for, at the spike, then 74% most likely uh, this protein originated from uh, a bat coronavirus and 26% chance from a camel coronavirus. Um, I mean, this is not one of those things you'd say like, well, because it's high in bats, then definitely it's a bat, but you know, you can't also just discount 26 or 34%. The other thing that we looked at in this, uh, these numbers uh, on the side here is that um, I looked at now the camels themselves. So what does the Markov jumps say of the origins of the camel virus themselves? So if you look at the whole genome, it's estimated that 35% uh, chance that, you know, um, that genome came from a human virus actually. And if you look at specifically spike, the odds of the origins of that camel uh, spike actually comes to 61%. So, which is quite interesting. I mean, it, you, you, you immediately ask yourself, like, is there a chance of adverse zoonosis there? Like, do the camels actually have uh, uh, actually a human spike uh, origin in that sense? So, this is still not certain. So, it, 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 it makes, you know, that, that um, ancestry doubtful, but it does not discounted. So it's just like, okay, maybe probably we need more data to know what's going on there. So um, just a quick one, any guesses where the bat origins came from uh, for the 229E and level 63? And if you might have read the paper at some point, then you know that these bats came from Kenya and, and Ghana. And again, probably highlighting an important aspect that there needs to be probably a lot of bat surveillance going on in Africa because there might be a lot of things that we don't know that's going on in those bat populations. So for the beta coronaviruses, so that would be HKU1 and also for the three, I start with HKU1. So that would be the one in blue here. You can see that there's a clear emergence from a murine coronavirus. So here I've collapsed the HKU1 into um, uh, a single clade, but remember that they have two genotypes, which I'll show in the next slide or two slides later. And you can see again, the long branch, which uh, correlates with, you know, those long um, uh, timings of the MRCA. Um, but then if you go to the OC43, which is here in red, you see that they share most recent common ancestor with this huge clay that comprises actually ungulate. So this would be the hoofed mammals. And particularly, if you look at which hoofed mammal these are, they're usually like even-toed and odd-toed uh, ungulates. So most of these are actually the even-toed. So they comprise bovines, you have um, water bark, you have deers, you have buffaloes in there. So the question is, it immediately becomes clear that um, we probably are not just thinking about ancestry from uh, bovine coronaviruses bovine coronavirus, I mean, but could it be that, you know, OC43 has ancestry in potentially these other angulates as well as like a canine uh, coronavirus? So this just highlights, it's just a zooming in onto, you know, the, um, the, the, the tree where we have, they share the most recent common ancestors, so this would be OC43, and this is that large uh, clay that comprises the different angulates. The other thing that has previously been reported is this um, cluster of uh, chimp uh, coronavirus. And this happened, uh, I think, in some country in Central Africa, where um, it's a study that's ongoing. So they're studying chimps. And I think the chimps were infected by their handlers. So of course, there is that human to chimp transmission going on there. So essentially, to summarize this, um, is that you know there is there are lots of other hosts that we are thinking about, not just the bovine. And again, going back to the mark of jam, so for HKU1, you can see that um, the likelihood of ancestry is quite high, that you know it came from a murine coronavirus. But if you look at the OC43 across the different proteins, you know, while for a membrane it's like 85% likely that it came from a camel, actually, not even a bovine there's only 1% chance that you know, it might have come from a bovine coronavirus. Look at the nuclear capsid, actually. You can see that you have this percentage is much smaller, so 28% likely to have come from a pig virus, 25% likely to have come from a bovine uh, coronavirus. In the spike, you can also see this. You know, so it's, it's 
probably shows that you know there's a lot of uncertainty in these origins for OC43 across the different proteins as also just largely across the genome. Um, the other thing that we are interested in is for HKU1 that this has this long branch. The question is, was this a single you know, jump from um, a murine coronavirus to a human, or was it, um, does this probably show two independent jumps? Because when you look at these two different genotypes across the different protein, there's that distinctive separation. Like you don't see in one tree A and B mixed uh, uh, with the other genotype and, you know, uh, distinctively uh, separate in another um, um, uh, proteins. But obviously, I mean, none of the genotypes is sharing a sister clade, let's say with a murine coronavirus at this point, which you would say like, okay, yes, there was a murine to, you know, probably separate introduction of that genotype from this. And so it could be that, yes, probably you had this jump into a human that, you know, rapidly diverged into two separate genotypes. Um, but then you ask yourself, like, how that would have happened, like, within a short time uh, across the different proteins, or was, were they just two separate jumps? We just have a uh, lack of sampling, uh, you know, which normally characterizes these very long branches in this phylogenetic trees. I'll try to move fast because, um, so if you, if you, again, try to look at uh, the timing uh, of the individual uh, genotypes, you, you see lots of overlap and you can't really tell which might have emerged first. So, um, uh, so the question still remains whether the, they were two independent jumps or just a single um, jump um, of, of two quite divided viruses. Yeah. So we go back to this figure here. So we can see that at least for some protein, there seems to be, you know, origin directly from bats for 229E. Um, is, is, is camel to human still likely? We don't know. And the fact that you look at the camel um, protein or the genome, and there's some likelihood that, you know, it could have emerged from humans. So is there a chance of reverse zoonosis? Uh, probably, maybe. For NL63 and HKU1, um, I mean, the status quo likely remains, but the question is whether like those two genotypes were independent transcriptions or, uh, okay, we don't have that incident again, right? <laughs> or uh, a single uh, transition from one host to another or two independent uh, transcriptions. When it comes to OC43, um, what, what we are able to show is that we are able to expand the pool of potential uh, origins of this uh, uh, vi human virus. So it's not immediately obvious and it's understandable that at the time that this hypothesis was put forward, a lot of actually these sequences were not available. So um, again, highlighting the fact that, you know, uh, a lot of this uh, science is, is about, you know, you, you keep updating the knowledge that you have and, you know, um, uh, and sometimes, you know, what, what you previously thought something to be keeps shifting or you just build it from there. So having seen how the diverse origins of these coronaviruses uh, uh, have, the next thing is looking at just the diversity within the different species. And what we immediately see at this point is, uh, at least from the whole genome, if you look at this summary here, um, that uh, HKU1 and NL63 were the most diverse. I'm remembering that these were the most recently isolated, and these two older strains seem to be less diverse. But if you decompose that into the two genotypes, as I, as I showed, what you see is that actually, um, one of those genotypes is still singly more diverse than, you know, collect, you know, even the rest of the other species, you know, together, but one of the genotypes is actually the least diverse. And of course, the spike protein, as has been shown in other studies as well, was the most diverse of, of these four proteins that we looked at, but this is at the nucleotide level. Um, but even at the amino acid level, as I showed, as I'll show uh, in a few slides, because the spike protein remains the most diverse of these four proteins. They had similar evolutionary rates, so there was nothing that was surprising. But again, you can see for the envelope, they had wide confidence interval, and this has to do with the envelope itself. It's a, quite a very short protein, and 
you know, it's not information rich if you think about, you know, how much diversity it has in there. So it's expected that, you know, you have this uh, uncertainty relative to the other, other, other proteins. So the next thing we looked at recombination, and this is just a simplistic diagram. So you can imagine that you have, um, so of course this is showing a deployed uh, state, you know, you have ideally you just have uh, 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 one particular strand, you know, having a uh, copy or, you know, uh, copy of, 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 of another genome into its own genome. So you have a hybrid in, in such a manner. So the green and the blue. So what we were able to see is that you see a lot of recombination. So 229E seems to be a recombinant, um, at least what uh, RDP shows is that, you know, a recombinant of BAT as well as potentially other uh, coronaviruses from other different hosts. But then the interesting uh, thing that you're also able to see is there is also a lot of recombination within the species as well. And the same for NL63. So you do see what you expect as you know uh, a virus being recombinant, you know, of viruses from other hosts, but also within species. So while this had been shown for HKU1 and OC43, so with the within species recombination, but this had not been actually shown for this alpha coronavirus, so which we find quite interesting. And actually, um, uh, so you see for HKU1, of course, you do see. Uh, lots of this potential recombination flagged with the different uh, ungulate hosts, as well as you know the murine coronaviruses, um, uh, and also no, I mean that's for OC43, but you also see a bit of that with the HKE1. And uh, lastly, in this section, what we are also able to see is also like interspecies recombination. So, for example, 229E and NL63. And if you think about this in the context of the delta cron that we're now thinking about, then it seems that you know what we observe here is probably not far-fetched. So it's 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 not wild to think that probably this seasonal coronaviruses, because as you can imagine, uh, probably there's lots of co-infection with this uh, seasonal coronaviruses. So there's there's some recombination that might be going on um, between them as well. So and and you begin to think about you know, what the implications these have for, for the recurrent epidemics and the persistence within the human population and how they're able to sustain, you know, the endemicity in the human population. So maybe this is also a significant contributor of, of, of why that happens. So the next thing we're looking at is looking at the recombination rate. So one, the quick things I'll, I'll tell you. So one, just ignore the envelope, the membrane and the nuclear capsid and we just focus on the spike and the whole genome. So the quick um, summary here is we have R over theta. So this is just a, a ratio of the combination rate to the point mutation rate. So these are estimates that you get from the clonal frame ML software. So the higher it is, it means that you have a higher rate of recombination relative to point mutation. And then you have this R over M, which gives you which tells you in, 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 in short that you had this much more recombination relative to point mutation. And then you have delta V here, which should tell you um, how many uh, substitution were introduced into that particular genome or uh, protein by each recombination event, okay? So if you just look at uh, all the seasonal coronaviruses lumped together, so just at the general level, so alpha versus beta, you can see that the recombination rate uh, is to point mutation rate is much higher in the beta coronaviruses, yeah? But if you look at how many substitutions by recombination event are introduced either in the, across the whole genome or uh, within the spike protein, you can see that that is much higher in the alphas. So higher recombination rate in the beta coronaviruses, but uh, the alpha coronaviruses for each recombination event, you have a lot more substitutions. The second thing that comes to mind, so we, um, uh, I, 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 what I did was to try and look at if, if what we see in this aggregated data set still holds, if I remove every other uh, seasonal coronavirus except one seasonal coronavirus and and all the other hosts. So looking at that recombination rate. And you can still see that 
um, the beta coronaviruses, so here HKU1 and OC43 still have higher rates than you know, the, the alpha coronaviruses. And the same still uh, persists that they have. Uh, so they are lower rate uh, of recombination to port mutation, but they have higher substitution per recombination event. But then the next thing that I was also interested in is, is remove every other host. So you're just looking at within species recombination. So for example, recombination just within 229E. And then what you see is that within um, species recombination, the highest rate is in 229E and OC43, and actually the lowest in HKU1. And if you remember the, the, the slide that I presented looking at the diversity in this coronaviruses, you can see that this is a complete flip of, of that because you know the most this was the most diverse and this was the least diverse. And you ask yourself, like, why does this have a higher recombination rate relative to this? So again, going back to probably the, the answer lies here is you, you see that if you look at how much substitution per recombination event, um, again, you see this flipping back to what we saw with the, the diversity. So whether there's some, you know, some sort of inverse relationship between the rate of recombination and also uh, probably whether there's some compensation for uh, 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 you have low recombination rate, but you know, you make up for it, quote unquote, for each recombination event happening there. It's something that you know probably somebody would need to look at uh, in the lab and, and be able to show that that actually happens. Um, but I think I just wanted to put this slide to to put into context. So looking at all the recombination going on, uh, I mean at least for something like two to nine e, when you think about uh, having the different genome segments having origins in different uh, uh, hosts. So this is a study that was done and they've actually been able to show that it, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 itself seems to have had, so they've broken this down into four different regions. And they estimate that fragment one and three, so this one here and here, could have been from this uh, bat coronavirus, the RATG13. Fragment two is most likely having origins in a pangolin coronavirus. And then, uh, this fragment four actually has origins in a different uh, bat coronavirus. So it seems that there's so much recombination event, events happening with this coronavirus is that you, you might not have even just different proteins having different origins, but even the same protein probably diff having different portions of that singular protein having different origins, which is just quite interesting. And, and, and you might think, I mean, it, 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 it muddies the waters if you're trying to to do your surveillance and thinking about where the next uh, 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 coronavirus might actually come from. And again, this is something that uh, uh, I talked about earlier. So thinking about the Delta cron, which you know has been shown to be uh, a recombinant of Delta and, and, and Omicron. And I think the most interesting thing is you see that perennially the, the, the spike seems to have come from Omicron, but you know, other chunks seem to come from Delta, but this seems to be a constant uh, thing. And I think uh, I like this quote from Darren that says that, you know, uh, uh, a Delta Omicron, oh, that's a misspelling, the combinant without the, this spike would be more difficult to detect because its phylogenetic placement would not be strongly impacted. So I think essentially what I wanted to highlight with that is that you might probably not see uh, or detect some recombination in some of this data set. And sometimes it could be that it could be earlier on in the epidemic or some of them, because the signal is not there, does not actually mean that, you know, that uh, recombination is, isn't happening. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> Yes, so Peter says he's yeah, looking at the Delta Crown. So, so the, the other thing that I was interested in is you was just doing a test of selection. So how much selection is going on? And the two things that uh, I was able to do. So look at genoid selection. So which gene seems to be under selection relative or which proteins. And for um, alpha and beta coronaviruses, we're able to show that at least, so for all these uh, proteins, uh, in the alpha coronaviruses, so 229E and then 63 So all the four proteins seem to be under some form of selection. But if you uh, look at um, 
uh, the beta coronavirus is only the spike and the nucleocapsid which seem to be under some form of selection. Then the next thing, obviously, because we are interested in those host transitions, so if you select just the branches leading to, 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 to the human uh, host, then we did not, uh, well, I mean, the expectation would be like, you know, during that adaptive process, you should be able to detect some uh, selection pressure there, but we're only able to see this uh, for OC43 in the spike and NL63 in the nuclear capsid and nothing else. So um, that, is, is quite interesting. So we don't know whether it's just a methodical issue or uh, it's just the data set why we can't see that. So lastly, because uh, time is, is spent. And so we try to look at amino acid substitution. So here I'm showing the different proteins and uh, highlighted here at the top, we have the different domains. So you'd have probably the N-terminal domain, transmembrane and the C-terminal domain. And other domains in the nucleocapsid, like the link and the link and dimer, and uh, the different many domains. I'm sure probably you're now familiar with this, especially for the spike. So while for these other proteins, you don't see a spike or lots of, so on the y-axis, you have the number of amino acid changes that, are, that were uh, detected at that position. And on the x-axis, you have the amino acid position. So not much consistency in this other protein, but for spike, you do see this uh, spike here, especially in the N-terminal domain and also in the uh, receptor binding domain, which is something that has been shown quite a lot with, with SARS-CoV-2. So that, that is, is, is expected. Um, so the next thing we're interested, obviously, is uh, the kind of changes that are associated with the host jump branch. So which changes do we see might indicate um, an adaptive process? So collectively, we saw that uh, in this reconstructed, ancestrally reconstructed amino acids, what you do see is most of the changes were associated again with NL63 and HKU1, which are quite diverse. So, I mean, you're thinking, why these two? Is it because, you know, they came much later? So there was, you know, a lot of immunological pressure. So did you have, you know, a lot more changes that, you know, had to happen for that adaptive process? But then when you look at the evolution itself, so the constructed protein within the human population, a lot of those are associated with HKU1 and OC43, right? And then um, for, again, looking probably at an immunological angle, you ask yourself like, are there common positions that seem to have had a change during that host transition process, which might mean that this is always critical for that adaptive process into the human host. So we did not see a single position that seemed to have changed, you know, uh, it, it, whether, you know, there was, the virus was jumping from a murine to a uh, human or a bat to a human, but we, do, we did see combinations of like three, uh, uh, coronaviruses, so it could be NL63, HKU1, and OC43. So some of these positions might actually be interesting to look at why those changes at those points are actually important along that adaptive process. And in summary, what we are trying to look at are positions that either converge to the same amino acid, or uh, you might ask yourself, you know, uh, what of positions that also diverge from uh, the same amino acid. So it means that that particular protein is not needed. We need to change it to probably a protein of a different class other than that particular one. We also saw changes that, you know, seem to happen, uh, you know, in parallel. So like from the same amino acid to, to the same amino acid. So this would often happen uh, for uh, viruses that seem to originate from the same host. Um, then there were this, um, uh, parallels that we've seen with some variants of concern. So you see uh, Omicron or Delta having this particular change in this uh, time frame, and we've been able to see those some of those changes also uh, with, with the seasonal coronaviruses, which we find quite interesting. Last but not least is um, we see also some changes that seem to be asynchronous. So for just giving an example here, NL63, so there's a change from a leucine to a phenylalanine at position 25, and at the same position, you see a change from isoleucine to leucine. So this seems to have lost the leucine, and this seems to have gained the leucine. Or you see like a complete reversal. So leucine to phenylalanine, but in the different 
virus, you have you know the Fenian Island losing uh, a change, and you begin to ask yourself why that is. And then sometimes you go back to that asynchrony that I was mentioning at the beginning. Is this related to you know those dynamics within the population and probably immune related, or why is or is it just something that's happening by chance? So uh, we are trying to look at those and trying to understand what probably those mean. Um, the other thing that we are also trying to look at and related to that is try to look at this um, amino acid changes temporarily. So, and across the different proteins. So you can see, of course, with the envelope, there are fewer changes over time, uh, but then with the nuclear capsid, the much longer proteins and with the spike, you can see that, you know, you have changes, you know, at, at, at in, in like for a given position. So on the Y axis, you have the position and here we've just, uh, correlated that with time. So the inferred uh, timing at that particular node or when that occurred. And also the other thing we are, we, we, we are trying to look at is for some of this position, you see a change from one amino acid to the next in one given species. Then at some point, you also see a similar change in another species. Um, so just trying to, to look at those and relate to what might that mean, especially for, con for convergence uh, that actually um, does, uh, you know, uh, become very interesting on what the implications are for, for, for that, for the human host. So uh, that's probably my last slide. So what we've been able to see is probably potentially direct transmission from a bat to a human uh, virus for 229E, even though we can't discount that probably it might be that some of this um, protein or at least some of the 229E uh, genome might also still have origins in camels. For OC43, you see, rather than you know, thinking of uh, being uh, certain about origins in, 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 in bovines, we see a larger pool of these angular coronaviruses that you know these viruses might have emerged from and, and, and canine coronaviruses. I mean, if anything, if we've looked at how um, uh, how many other species SARS-CoV-2 has been detected in and the most recent, like the outbreak in, in, in the white-tailed deers, then obviously these are things that you know become quite apparent that it's 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 not weird to see that you know you could have origins in all these different hosts, especially the ones that you come into contact with so often as humans. There's that early emergence for HKU1, but you know it's quite uncertain was this whether single or multiple transmission events, higher diversity in this, you know, uh, the most recently isolated um, uh, seasonal coronaviruses, lots of recombination going on there more than probably previously thought, including those, you know, between species. Uh, and as I've said, if you think about Delta Cron, then this makes it uh, actually likely to, to, to happen rather than just a computational thing. And you see this variable uh, recombination rate across the genome and also by, by species. And, and the, the takeaway home here is how much of this recombination actually contributes to the sustenance of that virus in, in, in the human population to cause the recurrent epidemics. And the next thing, if you're thinking about the next question is what drives all these diverse you know, origins and diverse timings of this you know, emergence of these viruses? Is it something purely random? It just happens by chance? Or is it something to do with host geography? Because some of these coronaviruses, they also seem to have you know, predominance in particular regions. Is it something related to host behaviors? We come into contact, you know, with animals. You know, it's we're increasing the likelihood of that happening, or is it something that is just, you know, uh, seems to correlate with the host community? So I must say that some of the limitations is obviously um, the shorter fragments, especially associated with the envelope and the membrane. So um, that. It's, it's hard to, to, you know, for example, looking at just how short of a fragment, like it's not phylogenetically rich or informative to, to make strong conclusions from those. And also sometimes the data sets are also actually quite few because if you look at, for example, um, the bats that are in close, uh, at least phylogenetically with the humans, 
they're actually grossly undersampled. So um, probably there needs to be more sampling done there. And also because of course we have to have the combination free data sets that you know we, we lost some data there. And for obvious reason, I mean, we can't use you know uh, for that to make phylogenetic inferences because we might just end up with the wrong conclusions. So I'll end there, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Sorry, this went a bit of a time that has to do with probably the interruption we had midway. So thank you for listening. Ah, thank you, James. Um, sorry, Martha, I had to drop. She had another call. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining, and thank you, James. I have to admit, I'm going to have to. I don't know if you can hear me properly. This mic is a little off. Yeah, I can hear you. OK. Um, yeah, I'm, I have to be honest, I'm going to have to rewatch this um, because that was a lot for me. Um, but there are people here who've been working with coronavirus for a while, so I'm sure that they followed everything. We have some questions. I had one actually which was similar to the last question that you highlighted, which is the next question. So I'm just going to continue with, um, or Leighton did ask, and this came up before, whether there's a place publicly um, where we can access data for co-infections. Uh, can you perhaps answer or give guidance to that? Or do you know if there are any available? No, you mean particularly looking at co-infections? Uh, data for um, that includes co-infections, yeah. No, but um, what I know the, uh, because I've heard that the NCBI, what they're trying to do is, so, or what anybody can do is, you can simply go to, for example, the SRA, where you have the short reads. And just try to look at you know do taxonomic identification so whether do you see within a given sample you know for example oc43 and hk1 in the same sample so that's that's an easier way uh, or place to start but often i think for epidemiological studies somebody would just tell you like oh yeah three percent of our infections were you know co-infections but really there's no standard repository for where you know those would be put uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, or Leighton, I don't know if you want to maybe yeah. rephrase it. Or... Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I wish it was as easy as going to the sequence read archive to look at, you know, the metadata is not that well annotated, unfortunately, especially for the sequence read archive. So yeah. you would need to, you know, pull those reads down and yes. do a little bit of analysis before you can even determine whether there are um, multiple strains in one sample or not. Right. So I wish it were as easy as just looking at, you know, whatever metadata they have in the SRA run table, and you could just find some of those information, but it's not that easy. But yeah, I get your point. That's what I know is NCBI is doing it, and they, they've been, I mean, if you look at this, this um, study that, uh, Jesse Bloom did, I think, when he went back to actually look at the, the, the initial reads that came from China, just, you know, when everyone was like, oh, is this a lab leak or is this, you know, actually something that is, you know, zoonotic. And so it's, yeah, it, it's not easy, but that's the, <laughs> at this point. So I'm hoping that that process, I don't know when it will be done, but obviously I can inquire because I know it's happening. It's at what stage uh, are they? And if it's something that, you know, we are going to end up with a database that, you know, if you go into SRA, it's not just going to tell you that this sequence was deposited and it's uh, it's a OC43 coronavirus, but, you know, in there we've also detected some human reads, we've detected some bacterial reads, we've detected this other coronavirus in that data set. So obviously that would be very helpful. Yeah, thanks. I also heard that they are also trying to get more data points like vaccination status of those individuals, which would be nice to have as part of the, the thing. Yeah, I think if there's anything that GSA has challenged the NCBI, it has to do with that. Like, obviously, they have to add metadata. I mean, if you look at what's happening, everyone is reporting like, oh, we downloaded this data set from GSA. Then, you know, nobody says like, oh, we downloaded this data set from Genbank. Yeah. You know, because everyone wants to, to, to use data that, you know, is clearly annotated. There's a lot more information, so you can make a lot more inferences rather than, you know, the, the gen bank tend to be a little bit bland, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah actually, um, thanks, Leighton. I also kind of had a question with regards to the metadata and the filtering that Leighton was asking about. Um, I don't know if you can answer it, but I was wondering how many of the data you actually had to chuck because of incomplete metadata. Um, 
or in terms was it of, fine? Uh, okay. In terms of proportion, I wouldn't tell. But what, what I often see has to do with, um, you do know, I think it was until 2007, for example, when, I mean, for GenBank, you didn't even have to submit your collection date, you know. So mm -hmm. at the beginning, they just like, yeah, you just put in and put in whatever you want. So, um, so you do have that, especially I think for sequences pre-2006, 2007. Um, for me, I, what I also went ahead and did, I mean, it's, it's something that, you know, probably people don't say enough in manuscripts, but I had to do a lot of digging. So because a paper is available, you have to go through that paper and find out like when were these samples mm -hmm. collected. Sometimes you have to make hoops through 10 papers because you know they're referring to something else and something else in another paper and something else and you know, <laughs> you get, yeah. and I, I, there are also people like I actually had to write to, like, okay, would you give me the dates? And the other thing that I also found challenging, especially for this data set has to do with the host. So you, for coronaviruses, there are a lot of lab studies that have been done. So you might just take something and think it's, it's actually was isolated from a, a human sample, but actually it's something that has gone, you know, through 900 passages. So you, you put it in there and you think like, oh, wow, that thing has a lot of changes. But, you know, suddenly you realize that this is a lab strain that has nothing. So also that yeah. helped, like, you know, just writing to people and they're always very helpful. And like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a human strain for certain, but, you know, it's been... It's been a lab strain, so don't even use it. So that's why I had to filter. For those that had passage information, at least, I would just like uh, anything that I think was more than 10, I just eliminated from my analysis. Yeah. Okay. I, I just use 10 as an arbitrary cutoff, not that it means anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. And then I'm just going to take one last, I'm gonna honor Martha's question because she had to leave. So I don't know if you can see it in front of you as well, uh, James, if you wanna follow. She says, it was interesting to see the differences in the types um, of substitutions between the alpha and the beta coronaviruses, which obviously suggests the constraints of evolution. And it will be interesting to study these taking into account the differences which has already been said between the host ranges and the genome organization. And she was just wondering how this would relate to the geographic distribution um, of the genomes um, that are being compared. Yeah, so that's a good question. So again, the limitation here is because this, this viruses have been primarily associated with the mild symptoms. So people have, you know, they've been mostly neglected. So there are very few studies. In fact, I might say that the most recent mice papers that have come out of, you know, seasonal coronaviruses for the, you know, long-term studies have come from Kidifi. And I think there's one good study from uh, the UK. So I think it's from Ireland. So at this point, I mean, we also wanted to do like some geographic analysis and distribution, some cool phylogeographic analysis with this. But then you suddenly realize that, oh, somebody in the UK sequenced this for uh, 2005 to 2010, and then there's nothing else from that region. And you're like, I'm pretty sure there's still coronaviruses there. It's just a <laughs> bother to do, to do anything. So you see, you don't also want to make inferences like, oh, this came yeah. from this place, but it's just that, you know, the sampling was from that place at that particular time. So that's why Gaps, we, yeah. we, we didn't yeah. pursue that for this. So, but okay. it, her question is valid that in the sense that if you're looking at the divergent, uh, you know, recombination rates, obviously like, yes, it has to, it must have some angle in, uh, you know, relating to, the ancestors from which these viruses came from, um, and you know, just in the also in the other host that probably it circulates in. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you, James. I just want to remind everyone that we do have it, uh, or Leighton has seen to link to our YouTube channel where this will be uploaded. Uh, thank you for all those who came and came back after the incident, and <laughs> thank you, James, for um, yeah, for being our our talk speaker for today, um, all the way from the US. I think it's still probably early morning or afternoon there. So thank you. It's nine um, in the morning. <laughs> oh, nine now or nine when you started? Nine now. <laughs> oh, nine now. Okay. Thank you. You started at eight. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, and then for everybody else, we will be having a new speaker for, I think, May, June. Um, and we will, we will be keeping you updated via the tweets. Um, about 
the next talk that's happening. Um, but yeah, thank you for the insightful talk, James. Um, right, and too. we hope to see you again. I think you still owe us a course. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah and thank you, Leighton, also for being our host today and for salvaging what was happening. Um, and yeah, that's a goodbye for us. All right. All right. Enjoy the YouTube. Yeah, I think I will reach out to James later on for certain other questions. Well, thanks a lot. Bye. Please do. Please yeah. do. All right. Okay. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye.